Good morning, Pastor Rob here, continuing our study of Mark chapter 3, the book of Mark. It's football season. Hope everybody's wearing their favorite team, their favorite colors. Uh, so Ohio State had a baptism. Uh, some of the players up there were preaching the gospel, and that's just, uh, as a fan, makes you proud to see guys stepping out boldly in faith, preaching the gospel, preaching, just standing true to what they believe in. The whole world stands true to what they believe in. Um, I've heard some negative things, but you know what? Why, why would you fault somebody for standing up for what they believe in? I'm proud of them. They did a great job preaching the gospel, and that doesn't necessarily mean Ohio State agrees with my views, but I am a fan. Go Bucks. So I hope everybody's doing well. We're in Mark chapter 3. Try to finish the chapter. Some interesting things here. Number, number one, a thing to remember is this. If you follow God, don't expect people to understand. Don't expect anybody to um, endorse what you're doing. It may be very confusing to some people. If you say, I'm going to step out and serve God, it may people find that very confusing at times because uh, even family will say, and I experienced this, um, they, uh, they, they would say, well, why won't you continue to go be a doctor and then go be um, a preacher? And I walked away from my school at um, Florida to uh, um, pursue ministry. So full scholarship, full ride, uh, even an opportunity to play football back in 1994. But I just really felt God get a hold of my heart and didn't feel like I was living correctly, uh, even to even dis disrespecting my wife in our first couple years of marriage. I was more interested in everything but her. And uh, it wasn't necessarily uh, the right thing. So I, I just did a self-inventory and God got a hold of me. I repented of my ways, and by the grace of God, my wife stood by my side, and we're here we are 31 years later. So, but don't expect anybody to understand that. They expect you to go out and achieve, you know, make money, become famous, be a contributor to society. Most parents will say, though, and I agree with them, is you don't care whether your kids ditch, uh, dig ditches or become doctors, lawyers, and astronauts. You don't care. You're going to love them the same. That's the way I feel, too. So um, I just would rather help mine achieve their dreams, whatever they may be. Um, as long as they don't conflict with the Word of God. That's, that's, that's the way I am. All right. So Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house again, and crowds gathered. Look how Mark focuses on this. The crowds are gathering. We were just on the shore. Jesus had to get in a boat to prevent from being crushed. And now he's in a house again, possibly Peter's house, getting ready to have a meal. And so it was so crowded that, and you've seen this. If you've been in the military specifically, if you got a bunch of guys in a platoon or a company or going into a chow hall, sometimes just getting a chance to eat, you know, it's so crowded, you can't move your arms. And in this case, Jesus is be, be very popular with the people. And so the crowds gathered so that the disciples were not even able to eat. So either they were preventing them from getting to the table or they couldn't move to eat. Um, so the disciples were not even able to eat. So you see the crowd gathered. Jesus is here. They're in a house. The disciples are here. And then when the, his family, Jesus had a family. This is Mary and his brothers and sisters. Some people don't believe he had brothers and sisters. John chapter 7 would speak to the uh, counter of that. He definitely had brothers and sisters. Um, and they were not able to eat. We know Jesus was the firstborn because Mary was a virgin when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So uh, they weren't able to eat. Verse 21, Mark chapter 3, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. This is what I'm talking about. Say you have a straight A student. You're a straight A student. You're doing you're doing great. You got a full ride to whatever university you have chosen. But while you're there, you fall in love with Jesus Christ and you feel this tugging on your heart to go to the mission field, to go to Haiti, to go to the Ukraine. I mean, I have this is a real life experience to go to Lahore, Pakistan. These places and God gets a hold of you and you walk away from maybe even a full ride scholarship to whatever college you've chosen and said, "I can't do this any longer. I have to do what God's called me to do." Don't expect your family to understand. And that's what happens with Jesus. Even though Mary had these visions with the angel and, you know, that what you have conceived will be by the Holy Spirit, she's still human. Don't put her up on the pedestal she doesn't belong on. She was a human. She was a sinner. And she needed a Savior. And that Savior, believe it or not, was her own son. But she didn't necessarily even believe it. Remember, even in her humanity, they lost Jesus on the way out of Jerusalem one day for five days when he was 12 or 13 years old. So he's preaching, the crowds are gathering, people are starting to talk. Now the family's getting involved saying, you know what, 
we better check on him. Something's not right. So they go after him. Verse 21, they heard about his family. They went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. And the word there is existomai, which means he is insane. His own family, his brothers. And you can see that again in John chapter 7. They thought his brothers thought he was crazy. If you're the Messiah, go to Jerusalem, because isn't that where you should be? Quote, unquote. They didn't believe in him either until later on in life when James began to follow him. But even his mother, let's go check on him. We think he's insane. And the crowd's saying he's insane. Um, and so let's keep going. And then the teachers of the law, verse 22 here, are going to say he's insane. So the family decides they're going to come in. So don't expect people to understand you. If you have a vision from God and you're like, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to give up everything. I have to do this. They may not be on board. Stand strong. If you know God's called you, stick to it. Stand your ground and go do what God's called you to do. He'll give you the power to do what he's called you to do. So verse 22, and the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem and said this, not only is he as insane, but they're going to say he's possessed by the devil or Beelzebub, the chief of the demons, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. Now this doesn't make sense. And Jesus is going to point that out. So he's doing what he's called to do. He's drawn huge crowds. People think he's crazy. His family thinks he's crazy. And now the teachers of the law think he's possessed by a demon. So look at all, not very popular with the status quo, so to speak. But don't expect people to understand what you're doing if you're truly sold out to what God's called you to do. So Jesus called them. He called everybody in. And let's speak. Let's have this conversation. America, where are we today with conversations? Have a tough conversation. I was just talking to a friend of mine, he's black, and we were just talking about how easy it is to hate somebody when you don't have a conversation with them. How easy it is to hate somebody of a opposing point of view when you don't shake their hand, look them in the face, get to know their name. And this was Nazism. They gave people numbers so they didn't have names, so they didn't seem personal to the people. And if you can stay at odds with people because you, you, you don't know them, take a chance and get to know somebody that may even have an opposing view from yours. Talk to them. Be a grown-up. Be a man. Be a woman. Face up and have a conversation. So this is what happened. Jesus says, I'm not running from this. I'm going to have a conversation. So he calls everybody in. And he speaks to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? What's my number one rule when it comes to following the, the word of God and to understanding life? Common sense. This is a common sense question. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. So Satan's divided against Satan. His kingdom's divided against his kingdom. And if a house is divided against its health, a house cannot stand. And I would say this to America today. If we remain divided, and isn't it interesting how we are being divided amongst these little lines? It may be denominational lines, which I keep talking about. It could be spiritual lines. It could be um, racial lines. It could be cultural lines lines. It could be sexual lines. It could be all of these things, educational lines. Hey, I don't like to say the M word because I don't like the team up north. I'm divided, but it's a good, it's a good, clean fun in that when it comes to um, sports. But don't be divided. Don't be divided. You can disagree, agree to disagree, whatever, and go on with life, but still have each other's back in some way or another. But a kingdom divided, a country divided can't stand. A kingdom divided can't stand. A house divided can't stand. A family divided can't stand. We've got to stick together, even if we disagree. So if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand and his end has come. Scary thought for America. If we continue to remain divided, has our end come? Is that something to really think about? Think about that. We need to stick together, at least when it comes to the flag, when it comes to the Constitution, when it comes to our freedom, when it comes to our sovereignty. We ought to stick together. Identify as Americans. Disagree if you don't want to agree with somebody. But at our common core, we have to hold something together or we'll never last. So Jesus is saying the same thing. In common sense, if, if Satan is divided, his army is divided, his kingdom divided, his house is divided, how in the world is Satan going to stand? common sense. It's not going to work. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand and his end has come. He's already finished before he even gets started. And in fact, um, no one can enter a strong man's house. And so if he's united, nobody can get in and, and stop him. But if he's divided, he's conquerable. 
America standing strong together as a culture, standing strong, defending our borders, protecting each other. We can stay strong and we cannot be conquered, but when we're divided, we're conquerable. So if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, his end has come. Verse 27, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. Okay, and we'll stop right there. Because remember, what is, the, what is Jesus going to do? What Satan has at this time is possession of the human race. He owns everybody in sin. He is holding everybody hostage for eternity, except that here comes Jesus. He's going to expose Satan. He's going to bind Satan, and he's going to free the captives because he's going to show Satan who's boss, the original OG, Jesus Christ, for lack of a better term. He's going to bind Satan, and he's going to set us free if we choose to allow him to set us free. Some people will remain captive. They won't leave. That's what they want to do. Verse um, 28, I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. This is very key to take all three of these verses or all four of these verses together because it means something very significant. So 28 through 30, I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. Now Mark chimes in, he says, Jesus said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. You cannot be saved by any name under heaven but Jesus Christ. You cannot be filled to enter heaven by any spirit but the Holy Spirit given from God. That's what he's saying. So if you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to heaven on my own terms. Well, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, if you say, I don't want that Holy Spirit. I don't want Jesus Christ. Because every believer is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You are a possession of his. He owns you. He's now possessed you in a, in a positive way. And the Holy Spirit is the down payment on our body, in our body, that says we belong to Jesus Christ. Now, if you say... I don't want that spirit. Or if you say Jesus is of another spirit, that, that blasphemy and that quote or that resistance to the Holy Spirit is an eternal sin. If you don't receive Christ, if you don't receive the Holy Spirit, you are condemned forever. John 3, 36, uh, Hebrews, if we, if we tread the blood of Jesus Christ under our feet, all we have to look forward to is judgment. So this is very key. If I think I can get to heaven any other way but through Jesus Christ and, and through the Holy Spirit, by grace, through faith, by the blood of Christ, then I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit because I think I can get into heaven some other way. And this is an eternal sin that cannot and will not be forgiven when you stand before God. So the hope is Jesus Christ died so that all men may have an opportunity to come to Jesus. All men. He don't care where you come from what language you speak, what your past looks like. All he cares about is your future in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. So, continuing on to finish chapter uh, 3. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. Like, this was going to mean something to him. And, and, you know, family does usually mean something. But family can also be your biggest distraction from things that you want to do. Uh, especially when it comes to calling uh, the calling of God. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Quite honestly, as a pastor, it doesn't make sense to me either sometimes because the rules in church and life are often quite different than, for example, business. And I had run my own business for years. It's a little different. You've got to be a little careful because people are so sensitive and, and salvation is so important. The rules change. You've got to be a little careful. As long as your Bible is consistent and foundational, and your parameters, but the, the governance of the church is very, you got to be kind of sensitive at times. So, so then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside, and someone called out to him. A crowd was sitting around him, as we already know, and they told him, your mother, brother, and sisters, or excuse me, your mother, no, they don't say father, because his father is God. Joseph was just a, um, a, a custodian of Jesus' life. His father is God. And so his mother and his brothers are outside looking for him. Again, he had a family, so he wasn't an only child. 
Who are my mother and brothers, he asked. No disrespect to his mother. He loves his mother. Don't get me wrong. But he's saying what's more important is not to be sentimentally attached to his family, but about the purpose God called him to, to, to be on earth for. It's easy to get sentimentally attached. Now, running a church, and I've been in four of them where we were running the church and doing the best we could. Sometimes, and even in my last church, sentimental attachments will override biblical truth and governance. Somebody doesn't want to hurt somebody's feelings, so they'll make rules that aren't even biblical. And that's, that's what I'm saying. It's very difficult to run a church properly because of those things. But Jesus is not going to allow his sentimental attachment to his brothers, his sisters, his sisters and mother to override what his Father from heaven has called him to do. Being sentimental is okay, but it cannot replace your commitment to following Christ. So, And it will. It'll, your sentimental attachments will definitely uh, make you go error in your judgment at times. Be careful. Family can be a big distraction. Nothing wrong with family. Be careful. That's all I'm saying. So when he looked at those seated in a circle around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And so it's about the common purpose. In America, we have to have a common purpose. Oh, hang on. Somebody's calling me.